What are Ephesians 5, 19 and 20 really all about? And in Churches of Christ, we've used those verses to back up a cappella worship, but is that really a fair reading of the text of what Paul actually said in Ephesians 5? Let's back up four chapters to chapter one when it, Paul talks about what all God has done for us through Christ and the work of the Spirit. We work into chapter 2 in the salvation that we find through Christ, and that salvation comes by grace through faith. This is not of ourselves, it's the gift of God. We move into chapter 3 talking about the body and the Jews and the Gentiles, and into chapter 4 talking about unity, unity of the Spirit, unity that we maintain, that God creates, unity that's given by God through the gifts that Jesus gives to his people for us to all use to grow into maturity and into unity. And that we should also behave in ways at the end of chapter 4 that lead to unity, taking falsehood and turning into truthfulness, taking stealing and turning into productive work that is helpful for those who are in need, and taking unwholesome talk and turning it into beneficial talk. And the very last verse in chapter 4 talks about us forgiving just as Christ has forgiven us. This is what a unified church looks like. In chapter 5, Paul talks about what it, is, what it really means to live as an imitator of God. He talks about the kind of behaviors that we should live into and the kind of behaviors that we should avoid, the ways of living and thinking and being as new people, people who have put on the new self, the new Christ, and taken off the old, that we're to be imitators of God, that we're to be the people of light, not the people of darkness, and then we are to really encourage each other. We're to build each other up, and we're to sing praise both to God and sing as encouragement to each other in Ephesians 5, 19 and 20. Paul is not in the middle of a chapter on making prescriptions for the worship service. In, in effect, what's happened in Ephesians 5, 19 and 20 has been we have gone to the scriptures to find answers to questions the Bible itself is not asking. We have gone looking for biblical authorization and biblical prescription for worship practices that the Bible just never clearly defines and lays out to the degree of specificity that we ourselves give to the text. We have to hear Paul for what Paul is saying in writing. In Ephesians 5, Paul is talking about the building up and the encouragement of the once divided, now united body of Christ, and that we are in this together, that we are not to be filled uh, with wine, but we're to be filled with the Spirit, and that outflowing and overpouring of the Spirit is song, it's, it's worship, it's encouragement. We have to be really upfront about what the passage actually says and what the passage actually doesn't say. We've treated this passage as if it said, sing and make music in your heart to the Lord, and if you do anything besides that, you are sinning, and because you're not repenting of that sin because you think it's okay, therefore you will go to hell. The passage doesn't say that. That's our reconstruction of a paradigm, of a philosophy of doing church and worship in a certain way that's created a certain uh, outcome and how we read those verses and how we hear those verses. We hear those verses as Paul specified the way of worship, which is singing, and to do anything else, to add and go beyond that specific, would be sin. Here's the issue. Jesus said, by the standard that you use to judge others, you will be used and judged it yourself. You know, can we take that interpretive method, interpretive scheme, and map that over onto other things and see that we come out in a consistent way? I really don't think that we can. If we say the Bible says sing, it says specifically sing, sing from the heart, and to add anything beyond the specificity of Scripture would be sinful. We don't apply that to greetings, greet one another with a holy kiss. Now we even at Corona days, you know, we're doing elbow bumps, we're doing toe taps and all this kind of stuff. We've said that's a cultural thing, we can do whatever we want with it. Yes, it's specific, but we can do whatever we want with it. We can do whatever we want with head coverings, yes or no. We can do whatever we want with First Timothy 2, lifting holy hands or not. In fact, we'd say lifting hands would be a bad thing. It makes us uncomfortable. It's just too showy that Paul instructed men to do that. We look at the specificity of gathering places that they met in homes in the temple courts. This is where they met. Now, you know, in all sorts of instances, we are perfectly fine taking the specificity of Scripture and, it, and adding other things to it. But in the regard of singing, we've said to add anything to that is actually sinful. And that, that's, that's an inconsistent approach to the text that I don't think does us much justice. And it really doesn't work out very well in our argumentation uh, for Ephesians 5, 19 and 20. And it really doesn't work out in context. That again, Paul is talking about what it looks like to live as imitators of God, as people of the light, and if you notice earlier in chapter 5, he actually did give a list of things that if you engage in these things, you will not inherit the kingdom of God. And notice he doesn't include in that list, which he so could have done if this had all been working out in context, the way we've gone to Ephesians 5, to say, and if you worship with an instrument, you're also sinning. If we're going to read and understand the Bible, 
we have to look at it with several things in mind, but these two in particular. What's the context, which I'm giving you, and the second is what's the authorial intent, and that's a really hard one to know, but what can be clear is what the author is not talking about. And in Ephesians 5, if you, if you read Ephesians as it was originally heard, to read it all in one setting, and ask yourself, what is chapter 5 there for? What is 5, 19, and 20 there for? When Paul initially wrote this and said what he said, wrote what he wrote, why did he write that? What was the purpose of it? What did Paul hope that we would get from it? And again, we're speculating here because Paul doesn't say, and here's what I hope you're going to get from it. But I think we have a hard time making the case that Paul expected us to read Ephesians 5, 19, and 20 and come away with it thinking that he was in any way, shape, or form talking about going to hell because we added something to what he talked about there. I think that's really a stretch. And I think Paul would be shocked at what we've done with Ephesians 5, 19, and 20 because in essence, we've really divided over Ephesians 5, 19, and 20. And we know what God says about division. That division is not what pleases God. It's not what God desires. We, we have taken from the silence of Scripture something and made it divisive when Scripture itself is not silent on division. I think we should be very careful when we do that. Now, if our consciences do not allow us to worship with an instrument because we've never done that and we have a certain view of Scripture that doesn't allow that and we are uh, in lockstep with our paradigm, which is restoration of New Testament Christianity, which, by the way, I think is a, is a good goal, uh, we've just kind of turned it into other things along the way, then, you know, if our conscience don't, doesn't allow it, we should not engage in that. I'm not calling for widespread wholesale changes in Church of Christ toward an instrumental approach. What I am saying is this, is that judging people based on inferences on the silence of Scripture and what Paul didn't say is a very dangerous path. And to make the instrumental music issue a salvation issue is equally, if not more, problematic. To say we cannot fellowship, which means you're not a Christian, someone of some, uh, another group who we agree on Jesus with, we agree on the Holy Spirit, we agree on God, we agree on baptism, we agree on many, many, many things. These are actually the very core items. But because you chose to add a guitar or something like that, you're no longer Christian. Uh, you just can't find that in Scripture. We can ascertain that through all kinds of induction and all kinds of patchwork of kind of piecing verses together of what worship is supposed to look like. But Paul doesn't give us a worship manual. We go and bit and piece things together. And often we've gone to verses through a concordance method. We say, you know, what does biblical worship look like? Let's go and find anything that talks about anything to do with singing or giving or Lord's Supper or teaching or preaching. And then we'll patchwork quilt these things together and we'll form a system of church that the church is supposed to look like based on various scriptures and verses from various letters and piece that together uh, post hoc, you know. Uh, after the fact, we, we piece these things together and we say, this is God's design for a church. Well, God never actually laid it out like that. That's not any explicit um, thing that God did in Scripture. He never gave our paradigm or approach to the Scriptures to come to those sorts of conclusions. And, and I believe that God, a God who would expect us to read Ephesians 5, 19 and 20 and come away saying that an instrument will absolutely send you to hell and didn't give us any warning of that when just, you know, 10 verses earlier he was talking about things that could send you to hell, uh, is, is a very dangerous thing. And God is a dangerous God in a sense. God can do anything that God wants, but I think it, it puts God in a very tenuous position to say that God expected us to read Ephesians 5, 19 and 20 with an 18th century uh, form of logic and reasoning, Lockean logic and reasoning, lawyerish logic and reasoning that wasn't even really around for 1800 years for us to reconstruct something that then, then becomes ex exclusionary criteria for other people. All I'm saying is that's dangerous ground. Now, if we want to take a safe approach, the Bible says sing, we sing. If we want to take a restoration approach, we're trying to be like them and they were, they were a cappella for 700 years and those sorts of things. That's great. But once we leap over to the realm of judgment, once we leap over into the realm of salvation issue, we are converting the silence of Scripture and aiming it at things that the Bible itself never explicitly or directly states or says uh, at the expense of the souls of other people and at the expense of the unity of the body. Now that's where I have a real problem. You know, I think we can believe what we need to believe on this. We'll all stand before God on this. We practice what we need to practice on this. We'll all stand before God on our practice. But what we know does not please God is division. And, and not let issues of preference 
divide us. We can certainly have our convictions and we can certainly think that our way is best and the way we do it is best. But as far as judging the other person down the street and the other congregation, I, I think we really need to be careful with our attitudes and actions when it comes to that because if we're excluding people in our minds of who we think is in, in Christ, uh, because of these issues that the Bible never actually says are issues, then we, we are on very dangerous ground. And the irony of this is the whole thing of adding where the Bible is specific and adding into the silence of scriptures being a problem, we're actually adding when we add in judgment that the Bible never gives. And so we need to be very, very careful about that in determining who is and who is not our brother, who is and who is not our sister based on the silence of scriptures. Uh, and so let's have an uh, attitude of grace, of humility, but also of conviction of our own beliefs and practices because the two can actually coexist. Our, the unity of the church and the love of the saints is not predicated on preference. And this is the realm that we are in when it comes to the silence of scriptures. We are firmly in the realm of of tradition. And again, if our view is that to add anything to the specificity of scriptures results in judgment, condemnation, and hell, then we actually have to do the due diligence of going back through our practice and make sure that what we're doing aligns with that principle. And I think if we did that, we would actually find out we don't come out very well. We would say we need to be meeting solely in homes, scrap the building, sell the building, meet just in homes. The Bible's very specific on that. We need to be lifting holy hands in prayer, men. We need to be not, ladies, not dressing with jewelry, not braiding of hair, definitely wearing head coverings, greeting with holy kisses, not handshakes, elbow bumps, foot taps, chest bumps, or whatever the case may be, because the Bible's specific on those things. And what we end up doing is embracing inconsistency. So what I would say is this, we either need to say the, that, that grace is going to cover the inconsistency, or else we're going to have to say we're going to actually have to get consistent and get on lockdown on some things that we've made ourselves too comfortable with. Now, from my perspective, we're leaning into the grace side that, that these are matters of preference based on the silence of Scripture. If God really wanted us to get this, he would have made this more explicitly clear to us. Uh, and so let's be careful in how we see others, how we judge others, and what our criteria is for who we see to be in the family of God and what it takes to really be a Christian. What it takes to be a Christian is to to get a, the fivefold acts of worship down just right on Sunday and get them at the right proportions and in the right order and these sorts of things for everybody to be okay. Uh, the Bible never tells us that. Now, that is, again, an assumption. That is, again, inference from silence. And so let's be very careful. Be very careful. I'm sure I'll get some kickback on it in the comments. That's okay, uh, because we are all still one in Christ. Because I know people who... Um, who are absolutely disregarding the things that Paul says will send you to hell and early in Ephesians 5 will at the same time thinking they're heaven bound because they're worshiping without an instrument. How crazy is that? Uh, but So regardless of what you think on this issue, we're still brothers and sisters in Christ and we are going to have to learn to get along even amongst our differences. And that is the beauty of the church, that we are not all the same, we do not all think the same, and yet we're still all united in Christ. And so God bless you. Thanks for watching. Subscribe uh, to the channel. More stuff coming like this. And, uh, and I hope it's an encouragement to you. I hope it gets us thinking. We have to examine things. We have to, to evaluate things for ourselves and not just take what we've been heard our whole lives and just take it with just acceptance without even thinking about it. We need to have a well-formed faith based on a solid foundation of Scripture that respects the authority of Scripture for life, for practice, for doctrine, teaching, etc. Because the Word of God is inspired by the Holy Spirit. And so I say all these things out of a great respect for the scriptures because I'm not willing to speak where the scriptures don't speak. And when we judge on this issue, we're speaking where the scriptures don't speak. If you're convicted of sing, then sing. But we have no scriptural basis to pass judgment based on this because the Bible itself doesn't do that. And I'm not willing to go beyond what the Bible itself says. Maybe you are, but that's between you and God, not you and me, unless you make it about you and me in the comments. And so we'll see you there. Uh, thumbs up, thumbs down, whatever you think. Uh, share it if you like, and uh, we will see you next time.